And uh, before I actually uh, uh, pass it uh, to Krishna, I would like to give you a quick introduction on SyncSort for people who are not familiar with the company. SyncSort has been in... Uh, uh, SyncSort is has been in software, uh, data management software uh, for uh, several decades. And uh, we basically are uh, uh, specialized in high performance and very scalable data processing, data management software, uh, data integration. And recently we acquired Trillium software, uh, leading uh, Gartner Quadrant for data quality for 11 years in a row. And uh, we have over uh, 2,500 enterprise customers globally uh, in the uh, United States, uh, EMEA, and Asia PAC uh, uh, across uh, the globe. 87% of Fortune 500 companies are our customers. And uh, uh, we really are very focused in terms of delivering business value, uh, focusing on the business use cases as opposed to uh, playing a platform play for big data integration or data quality. We offer the best of breed products for data integration, data quality, focusing on use cases. For example, liberating all uh, mainframe uh, and legacy data to be available for advanced analytics in the modern data architecture. Enterprise data warehouse optimization is another uh, uh, focus for us in the big data area. Hortonworks, in fact, is a reseller of uh, sync sort uh, software, and uh, we have a bundle to get, uh, together for enterprise data warehouse optimization. And data governance is obviously the key uh, uh, team uh, for this uh, conference and also for all of our enterprise customers. With the Trillium portfolio, we are focused to bring data quality into Hadoop uh, data lake. So where uh, we bring value is uh, uh, we, we recognized with our enterprise uh, customers, everybody was really trying to have this digital uh, uh, adoption and uh, moving towards modern data architecture. However, uh, when uh, you are in insurance, financial services, banking, healthcare, there are a lot of legacy data stores and silos in the organization that you need to make, uh, break those silos and uh, liberate all the data for uh, uh, processing and uh, for advanced analytics in the data lake. So that's one of the uh, use cases that we focus on. We make all data accessible uh, because when you are uh, streaming data or when you are bringing uh, online uh, banking or uh, uh, insurance policies uh, through uh, web services, you need to still access that critical data assets that are often in the legacy data stores and on mainframes. This is really a, a strength of us because we understand big data uh, we know big data and we have been in fact a, a contributor to the open source stack as well and uh, we also understand uh, mainframes uh, 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 we are experts in uh, uh, understanding mainframe data so that ability to map uh, is uh, one area of strength uh, making all data available for advanced analytics and uh, the two sales plays that uh, we early on focused are around enterprise data warehouse offloading, enterprise uh, data warehouse optimization. Uh, it's also referred as ETL onboarding. And uh, uh, we have a, a joint solution, a bundle solution with Hortonworks, as I mentioned. Uh, in this play, we see uh, a lot of our customers are really trying to uh, uh, create efficiencies, operational efficiencies around their existing Teradata data warehouse or Niteza or Oracle data warehouse and uh, uh, sustain uh, the uh, growth of that uh, while freeing some of the capacity and uh, uh, bringing uh, new workloads in the Hadoop data lake. And uh, on the second sales play, uh, as I mentioned, it's really making mainframe data available, accessible and uh, integratable with uh, other data sources, with emerging data sources from cloud, from mobile, and uh, from, web, uh, from web, and both of these obviously have uh, benefits in terms of reducing the total cost of ownership and uh, operational efficiencies. However, from our customer base, we have seen that bigger benefits come because of the agility they create, because of uh, also how fast they can take new products to, uh, to uh, market, and uh, also their ability to add new data sources instead of waiting six months being able to 
uh, uh, basically take uh, uh, new data sets, legacy data sets in the click of a button and create the corresponding metadata and populating data lake with Hive or C Parquet and uh, all the uh, uh, data formats on the target side. And uh, this is our reference architecture with SyncSort. You see us on the data ingest uh, uh, layer. You also see SyncSort in terms of data integration and ETL, extract, transform, load on the uh, uh, data lake itself. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are also focused on data governance and bringing data quality. We are one of the uh, early vendors uh, actually uh, uh, integrated with Ambari a couple of years back. And uh, we are, uh, some of the benefits we have, our customers do not really have to worry about moving from MapReduce to Spark. Uh, everybody who moved from MapReduce version one to two, uh, the same applications ran without re recompiling a single line of code or uh, changing the applications. We guarantee that and we enable our uh, customers, uh, we do the intelligent dynamic optimizations under the cover with our engine and uh, we enable our customers and applications moving forward to Spark, Spark 2, uh, and onwards. And uh, uh, we are certified with HTTP and HDF, uh, both uh, data platform and uh, data flow, and uh, uh, security and governance are very critical uh, initiatives for our customers because we uh, really work with uh, enterprise. So metadata lineage and Atlas integration are also our focus areas. Actually, we are showcasing in uh, boot 11, uh, uh, 1102, uh, if you would like to see some of those integrations. Uh, I will just summarize the value proposition. It's a graphical user interface driven uh, development. There are a couple of different uh, development options. Krishna is going to actually go over them. And uh, you can uh, uh, deploy the same application on premise and on cloud or in hybrid environments without making any changes and uh, uh, you use the same software development environment for batch and uh, streaming uh, data sources and uh, uh, we really make all uh, enterprise data, liberate enterprise data from some of the legacy data stores and we deliver that, we integrate and deliver it with integrity as trusted sources. I will uh, let uh, Krishna uh, share his journey and I want to thank uh, Krishna and uh, Progressive Insurance for partnering with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. So who hasn't heard the word data lake? Raise your hands. No one, right? So yes, yeah, so you haven't heard the word. Good. After the talk, you will know what data lake is. So if you have not heard the data lake, you will not heard data swamp as well, right? So, I mean, last two years, I think there's enough talks about data lakes and data swamps that everybody knows that we don't want to create our data lakes into data swamps. And I believe with good data governance initiatives, you can curate your data lakes and make sure that your data lands in the right area. But organizations and enterprises our scale forget about team, the development team, which puts the data into the data lake, the ingestion team. And today, I'm going to talk to you about how we want to create a flow of ingestion for all your data sources into your data lake. So let's talk about the big data use cases we did in the past. So we have three use cases. The first one is telematics. So that's our famous snapshot program. So if you sign up for Progressive Insurance, we would give you a device which will track your, tracking, which will track your behavior of driving. And based on that, you will get discounts. So even if you're a customer or not a customer, you can still sign up for that. The second use case is advertising. So now you see flow ads all over the place on the internet. And we actually compare and contrast which advertising campaign is better for us, kind of A-B testing. The third use case is claims data, when we try to analyze the claims and try to understand that what's more in the claims. So all these use cases required the Hortonworks cluster, the big data analytics. So at that time, we had this ingestion flow in our architecture. So on that side, you could see there's external data. It could be vendor-based data, and we used Hive 
and Java to ingest that data into our Hortonworks cluster. You can also see progressive data where we have SQL servers, DB2s, or Oracle databases, mainframes, or flat files where we ingested that again using Scoop and Java into our Hortonworks cluster. We used all the open source tools, which were Uzi, Pig, Hive, and MapReduce, to ETL the data from the staging text to the ORC-based formats. We didn't get to use Uzi schedulers because we had our own enterprise scheduling framework, which we leveraged it, which was going to trigger the jobs on cross-platform. We also put that data into the MPP appliance for star schemas, et cetera, et cetera. We went ahead and also created Hive instrumentation frameworks on Uzi, where I wanted to capture every single row counts for each action, whether it be a pig action or a hive action or a map reduce action, and store it in a hive database. We did balancing based on that actions. So we could fail an Uzi action right away if it didn't fit the bill. Now, as you see that the bunch of developers who started this had a lot of fun with open source. But when it came to reality, when I came to give it to the service management teams, we had lots and lots of support issues. So the first support issue is skill set, right? The developers who are going to support our tools were not apt at the open source technologies. They didn't know how to figure out Maven, Java, Artifactory. They were stuck in the Hadoop upgrade issues. Every time a new Hadoop upgrade happened, there was a UDF which broke, and we had to open the UDF, fix it, compile it, and then test it. Since the developers who were working were hardcore Java developers, we had the freedom and the potential to write lots and lots of custom actions. So we went and wrote custom Uzi actions. We wrote custom Uzi triggers, which would trigger these Uzi workflows and actually talk to our schedulers using Java wrappers. Obviously, we wrote pig and hive UDFs. We also dwelled into pig loaders. One of this report we wrote was a complex N-way hive report using JDBC where an analyst would tell us how many combinations of a report he needs to run, and we would generate it dynamically and have Hive queries run on the cluster and bring the report back. For developers, it was a really cool thing, right? Not for the guys who wanted to support this. We also wrote custom Hive 30s, complex Uzi workflows, bundles, and containers. So we had lots and lots of fun doing this. So now that we understood that there were support issues, we wanted to find a solution for this problem. And we said, how about we create a centralized team for Hadoop? This is gonna solve all the problems because we're gonna take all the talent, put it in one team, and make sure they do all the job for Hadoop. Well, not so much, right? We had IT warehouse teams and business analysts queuing up for projects, right? And even though we had a team, we still couldn't keep up with the flow of projects coming in. And I was wondering why. We have all the talent, now we could do all the projects with open source. That was the reason why. So we had resources tied up from requirements to ingestion to ETL to reporting all the way along. And the maintenance and the knowledge transfer issues came up between the team members. We also had no consistency in code. So every developer would take the project and do it in his own way. Some would use Java all the way. Some would use the old style Uzi, Pig, and Hive. Some would use shell scripts and Hive queries. So it was a mix and match of all these technologies. There was not a flow going on in our ingestion. So obviously, data lake is a possibility if you have all these data getting ingested, and the more speed you get into ingesting data, you can make data lake a possibility. So obviously, we weren't there. Projects were getting queued up. So we went and stepped back, and we said, OK, how about we go and get a tool which is going to shield us from all these craziness? So we went and said, OK, how about first requirements of our tool set? Right? So it has to be industrial strength. It should run natively on Hadoop. What I mean by that is it should be a distributed engine. It should run on Yarn. 
All data sources should be supported. I'm just not talking about your databases. It should support mainframes, vSAM files, FTPs, whatnot, right? It should be usable by non-Java programmers because majority of my support organizations were ETL background programmers. It should be satisfying all the security requirements, carburization, or whatnot. It should work with clouds. It should be able to push data into S3, right? I mean, everybody has data in S3. It should have an IDE, just like a Visual Studio or an Eclipse. People should open an IDE and figure out how can they munch their job or data. It should have enterprise support. So just like the Hortonworks support where we call in and get tickets, tickets resolved, SyncSort also has a phenomenal support. And every time we've called them, they've resolved our issue very quickly. Ability to customize frameworks is also important in an enterprise because we'll have ETL gurus who want to create frameworks on top of this to standardize the way we do ETL, to do reconciliation or to do balancing or to capture metrics. So we wanted the tool to be flexible. Obviously, it has to be with Pace, with Hortonworks, and the open source technologies, right? Lastly, it should fit with our internal build and elevate. I mean, most of the enterprises have their own custom in-house built or some external build and elevate tool. And this new tool, which we are trying to bring it to the ecosystem, should fit in really well. With SyncSort, once the job is coded, it is a bunch of files. So it fits in easily with existing tool sets. So we went back and did our anal analysis of all the tools in the industry. We did SyncSort, Talent, Informatica, Actian, CDAP and cascading. And all the tools are good in their own aspect, but for us and for our requirements, we picked SyncSort. It was a no-brainer for us. So now that we have the tool ready, we could go back to our flow and we could we changed all the places with the open source to have SyncSort. So SyncSort will ingest the data from external vendor data into our Hortonworks cluster. It will ingest data from all the databases as well. It will, again, do the ETL work, where it will take data from Hive staging tables to Hive target tables. So now let's talk about how would you implement SyncSort when you first get it. And if, if there are any Hadoop admins or any Linux administrators, this is how you will install SyncSort. So you have your Hortonworks cluster, and you have data nodes. On the data node, the SyncSort DMX client is installed. You have edge nodes where you have the DMX daemon installed. The developer machines will have the DMX H client, which can interactively talk to these daemons and do coding, and then you can push your job onto the cluster and do your unit testing or whatnot. Once the code is generated and it's files, you could take it to your source safe, right? And today it is TFS, or it could be your Git repositories. From there, the build machine is going to take that code and deploy it onto the edge node, and from there on, you can trigger it using your schedulers. It's just a shell script at that point of time. So now let's step back and compare SyncSort with Scoop because Historically, all of our jobs were scoop-based jobs. So I categorize it into four major categories, right? Connectivity. So scoop uses the database driver jar. So every developer will have either this jar or he'll use it from the share and have his own settings and user ID connections. With SyncSort, that problem is solved because you have one file which is administered by your Linux admin where you can get your entries in for the database connectivity. So that's a plus for, for SyncSort. The second big topic is in-memory transformation. So we have a use case, or most companies will have use cases where you will want to shred your PII data before you land it into HDFS, right? And your DBAs, your friends' DBAs, will not like you to do a query on the database side to do the transformations. So SyncSort gives us the ability to create in-memory transformations, and not just on the edge node, right? Not just single-threaded. It, it will allow you to do distributed in-memory transformations before you ingest data into HDFS. Parallelism is supported on both the platforms. Like I said, again, edge node ingestion is supported in SyncSort where you have small tables. If there are 100 row or 1,000 rows 
static tables which you need to join with your big, larger tables, you could just use it on the edge node to ingest the data. You do not have to wait for your multi-tenant cluster to spin up a MapReduce job. So let's talk about choosing the right interface. And what I mean by that is SyncSort DMXH has a GUI-based interface, and also it has a script-based interface. And the script base is called DTL, Data Transformation Language. Now, I again categorize this to make it simpler for people who are new to SyncSort, right? First thing is complexity. Obviously, to script a data transformation language is a little bit complex because you got to go and look at all the uh, uh, catalog of what functions, what, what not. So it's complex. The GUI is very low. It's button clicks. So you could do four button clicks and get your data into HDFS. So similarly, development time is higher in DTL because you have to figure out all the command, all the scripts. In GUI, it is medium based on your requirement. Flexibility is high in DTL, and the reason I say that is because once you have a base script, you can leverage that and you can actually share it with other developers who can parameterize this and then create their own scripts. And what I mean by that is, this is a visual of how it looks. On the first side, you have the DMXH DTL copy task. So as you see over there, you have a DB connection, ODBC, and you put your database name in there with authentication, user ID, and password. Your server connection is to your name node connection. And then in your DB input, either you can write your SQL query or you can give the table as an input. And I don't want to go again into the code, but you get the gist of it. That, that's a scripting language. The same thing you could do with SyncSort DMXH, the copy task, which is create a database connection, which is at the bottom of the screen. And once your database connection is created, you pick the tables and you can actually massage that data and before you land it into the target. And right there you have the target connection, right? So what I do when I start doing sync sort is I go and start with the GUI task to figure out the flow of it. And if I can generalize this flow and somebody else wants to use it, then I go back and script it so everybody else can use the same script. Okay, so now we are going to our data lake CDC patterns. For us, a progressive data lake is just not dumping the data into an HDFS folder or a Hive table and be done with it. We want to capture transactions. We want to capture insert, update, delete transactions on the sources. Either they are provided at the source level, or if we have to figure it out in the target level, we do that. And that's why we have four different patterns of change data capture. So the first pattern is CDC on source. If you have a transactional system where everything is an insert, it's a straight dump into a newer partition in Hive tables. Now, if the source captures CDC for you, that's well and good. It could capture insert, update, delete transactions, and you can bring that along every day and load it into a new partition. The next pattern is full extract. There still could be a requirement where people say that, okay, I don't have the trans CDC captured on the source, but I still want to figure out at the end of the day snapshot or what, what have changed. So what we do is we get both the day's file, keep it in uh, staging, and then we do the comparison using DTL join, a sync sort join, to figure out the insert update deletes. We don't recommend this pattern because for larger tables, it is hard to get in data every day at such volume and keep it. But we have it at the default use case. If nothing else works out, we can go to full extract. The third pattern is an incremental extract pattern, which is a classic time-based or a key-based pattern where you have in in ingested data from yesterday and now you know that the next 24 hours, you can filter the data in the tables and then bring the data into your HDFS as a new partition. That's an incremental extract. The last one is a no CDC where you have to just dump the data every day and then create still partitions from the business analyst point of view on how to query it faster. So there's four patterns. And all the developers have to do is pick one of these patterns for any of these tables ingestion. There's three stages actually we go over 
in this uh, data lake journey. So the first step is the staging. So the tables come and land in raw text. And we have a seven day rolling partition just in case we need to get the data again. Once we have that, we figure out insert, update, delete using syncs or DMXH DTL. And we insert that into a daily partition orc hive table. From there, we also give an option for our analysts to create a current view which just looks exactly like their source at that point of time. That's called the target. And all of that is done using DMXH DTL joints. So SyncSort also released another product called Data Funnel. And when they came to us with this idea, we were pretty intrigued and we really liked it. And what it does is, it goes to your database and gets the schema out of it, right? So if it can connect to your databases, get the schema out of it, and then it can create the hive tables on the fly. It will also generate DMX HDTL with bulk transformation. So if you need to go and scrub all the social security numbers from your entire database, you could do that in one place. And DMX Edge will do that in the DTL jobs. Data Funnel is a code generator which sits on top of DMX Edge. From there, it could ingest the data into HDFS or Hive. They're also working on a UI, which I'm pretty sure they're going to release soon, which help, makes it easier for analysts or developers to get the data into the data lake. For us, the idea was very intriguing, but from the IT's perspective, that what we needed was we wanted more of balancing, more of metrics in our own database, and we wanted it to work with our own frameworks. So we wanted it to be more for our business analyst as a self-service product, where a business analyst comes and takes the data in and does his own munging in his own use HDFS user space. So then we finally went ahead and created our own tool, which sits on top of SyncSort, which is, again, inspired by Data Funnel, but it does more from our enterprise standpoint. So we, it's just called Hadoop Ingester. So Hadoop Ingester has three different layers. The first one is Hadoop Metadata Collector. It goes and connects to the databases, gets the metadata, and creates a job object. The job object will have all your table entries. It will also have column entries for each table. Now the developer has the option to go and say, I want to change this table, this column, with this DTL transformation. And he could just put that DTL transformation in a database or a UI, and then the job is created. So the developers have a UI, which they open it up, open the job, edit it. They can, they can even split the columns by, so they can say, hey, for this table, I want to split it by this column with four mappers or you know, two mappers. So once they change the job in the configuration UI, they can save it in the database. And then the Hadoop ingester service takes it and creates the job. So you could actually run it in a no-execute mode, which, will, which you can see what code is getting created. Right? It could be scoop. It could be DTL. It could be Hive. And then once you see your code, you can actually elevate this code to production, and then it will run it, and also balance and do all kinds of metrics around it. So essentially, Hadoop Ingester is our way of ingesting data into the data lake with SyncSort. So this is the Hadoop Ingester service flow. If you have n tables. It could be 50 tables or 100 tables. It doesn't really matter, right? Each table will have its own flow of ingestion. So the first step of ingestion is a copy job, just like I showed, right? It's a DTL job. It will copy the data from the table one to a Hive staging database. Then we do Hive reconciliation. So we actually count the tables, rows, and figure out that, hey, are 100 rows in versus 100 rows out? Once that check is passed, we go to the next second layer, which is our CDC layer. So here we figure out what CDC pattern have to be applied. So all this stuff is beforehand inserted into the job by the developer. So now this table will use pattern two with DTL. And then it'll in insert the data into a Hive raw partition. We, ag we again reconcile this data, 
And then if the, you, the table needs a Hive target, we'll also create a Hive target. Now, as you can see that you can do all sync sort here with this tool, or you can have a mix and mash of other open source tools as well. So you could do scoop plus sync sort or scoop with Hive. So you could do all open source or all sync sort by itself. Now, at the end of the day, if any of these tables doesn't reconcile properly, we actually fail the entire job and do not mark it to complete for the next day, right? So it's just standard ingestion data warehousing concepts here. We also do all kinds of loggings here so I know when my jobs are getting slower. If there's a rogue job by an analyst as we have a multi-turn cluster, we can actually cap capture the timings of our all job runs and the counts. So all in all, with Hadoop ingester and sync sort, we have one code base for ingestion. We have a choice of CDC patterns. So out, if there is a fifth pattern, if somebody comes up and says, okay, your four patterns are not enough, we need a fifth pattern, we could still insert that into the same code base and everybody can leverage it. Every table is ingested the same way and sync sort shields us from any kinds of new open source technologies which we want to adapt. So if we need to run our same CDC on Spark, it's just a code change for us, and every table will run on Spark for the joints. Every table is reconciled and balanced. We capture metrics and counts. Ingestion time remains the same no matter the table count. So the tool doesn't care about if you have five tables, so 50 tables, or 100 tables. Our development time remains flat, and that is a big win for us. So finally, ingestion has gone from days to hours, and Progressive IT has a single entry point for ingestion at data, into our data lake. At the end of the day, we wanted flow in our data lake, and we wanted to knock this piece out of our way so we could focus on other bigger projects. Thank you. Thank you. That's flow. <laughs> Questions, yeah. So I saw that you do have a uh, SQL server in a parallel data warehouse. Yes. How does that fit into the picture? Uh, so I think we take the raw data, and for star schemas and other analytics, we push it to our parallel data warehouse. I know. Orc. E, yes, so the tool has the capability to automatically figure out the schema. It will fail the table. It won't even run the table because it is checking every day for schema changes. And then it's a manual intervention at that time. But we fail the table. It won't run. Yes. Yes. Yes, right. edge node. So give me some light. How difficult is the path upgrading board? Are they need to be simultaneously upgraded? No. Sync sort upgrade is very fast because it's it's managed by Ambari. So it's a, it's almost like five to six minutes. And we actually have tested beforehand in our dev and QA environments before we push out the changes. Five minutes. It's a client. So even on the data node? Yes. So it's just a it's, it's, it's so five minutes. Sync sort. But they, they don't need to be in the same cadence. So if you have a feature in sync sort which you want to get in before the HTTP, you can have a sync sort upgrade and move on. So did, did you guys see that all OBS and pathway? We didn't collide any time. No, sync, sync sort's promise is that they tested before, yeah. Every HDP release, they tested. Um, sorry, thank you. Um, how did your, by, again, redesigning your ingestion framework for flow, how did that favorably impact consumption of data in the lake by, by the business and data scientists? 
Well, first of all, we get all the raw history. So all our data scientists and all the business analysts want that. They want to capture every single transaction, right? That's, that's the best way to uh, show the data. But also the speed and agility of the ingestion has increased so much that now we could do the same ingestion in days. So yes, so now they can request for more pro projects, more data sources. They don't have to limit themselves by saying, okay, let's prioritize this project for this six months or whatnot. They could say, I want all of these and just get them in. Yes. Yes, so SyncSort does that. That is, I think, SyncSort is working with Atlas. They're actually working close with, close with the product managers, and they actually shield me again with that problem. So if I have my job in SyncSort, they'll take care of it. <laughs>